those of us that spend time on Midwestern rivers know that they're special. Our rivers here are just underutilized and underappreciated. They spend a lot of time being pipelines for water and sediment and nutrients, and that's how a lot of folks think of them. But they are exceptionally valuable resources. Rivers allow us to cover a whole lot more territory and see different parts of our state from a much different perspective. All right, guys. Let's get the raft rolled out flat, and then uh, you guys take a lunch break, and we'll get it wonderful fast. As we organized this river expedition, we wanted to focus on finding some individuals that would take great value out of it. We quickly landed on the opportunity to work with college students, particularly Ball State students. So we reached out to them and described the type of expedition we were trying to do on the river and experience we were trying to provide. And we selected four students ranging from natural resources, environmental management students to biology students. Uh, so we'll meet the ground crew back at the livery here in a couple hours, and then we'll head to mounds for the rest of our day today. So let's get on the water. That's what we've all been kind of waiting for, ready for. Um, again, thank you for being part of the crew, and hopefully this is a learning experience for you, but also one that gives you a little bit of relaxation and opportunity to be outdoors. Here, I'll take For this river expedition, we chose a beautiful section of the river. Um, it's complex enough to give you a little bit of a challenge behind the paddle, but also allows you to be slow enough to kind of observe what's along the banks, what's in the stream, uh, see the wildlife. We've got good riparian on both sides. I mean, we have the, the forested edges. There's a blue heron. You can definitely tell where farmers almost farm up to the field or the, the river edge. Yeah, so that's one of the things that the Nature Conservancy does. We, we spend a lot of time working with farmers to figure out how they can farm in a way that works with the river instead of against the river. Um, and one of those obvious ways is to not farm right up to the edge of it. We don't want farmers to be out of business. We're not anti-farmer. We just want to help them do the best practices. There's a good example of stream bank loss. So sediment is the leading pollutant in Indiana as we lose lots of topsoil into the river. What causes the topsoil to get into the... The river, especially with like climate change and things, is the river just gets higher faster and it gets uh, higher discharges and flows and it just takes the banks with it. I feel like we're getting pretty close. I see tracks and things. Hey guys, let's paddle a little bit. We're going to swing out and come straight into the landing so that we have a tip touching. Paddle a little bit. Sending. All right, somebody hop out maybe and grab the front. I'll do my best to keep us against it. All right, good job guys. Perfect. Good work. So as part of the experience on the expedition, we invited uh, Drew Holloway with the Muncie Bureau of Water Quality. He came to talk to us about electroshocking, which is a method of collecting data on fish species. There's a good variety in there. I see a sculpin in there. This guy's fun. Got some darters. Mm -hmm. Looks like. What is the one you're trying to grab? This one right here? Yeah. This is a rock bass. Wow. Mm -hmm. I've never touched a fish before. I'm really? kind of scared. No time to like know. present. I'm so scared of <laughs> yeah. them. Just wet your fingers first because they do so have a scared. slime coating. I'm so scared of fish. It's not going to go I think they're cool, right. but. <laughs> Drew is just an excellent communicator. He spends a lot of time with the public. Students ask some really great questions, and Drew was able to, to answer those and also put it in, in context so that as these students develop in their careers, they may see opportunities in fisheries biology or things related to the river. As a fisheries biologist for the city, we are out sampling the West Fork White River and its surrounding tributaries to test how healthy the stream is based on those fish that we find. So if you guys had to guess, how many fish species do you think we find in the White River? Like 30. 30, okay. Yes, yeah, so we usually say between 60 and 65 species of fish that we see. So when our organization started in the early 1970s, we actually only recognized about 30 different species. And with that water quality being poor, we had all kinds of industries dumping illicitly into the river. There were no rules as far as that went prior to the Clean Water Act. Now once the Clean Water Act was established, the river started to clean up in the 70s, a lot of those were tolerant species. 
So if something's tolerant to pollution, they can thrive. So as everything came back to normal, we actually have found all these other sensitive species. So smallmouth bass is a great example. A lot of the little darter species and minnow species are gonna be sensitive as well, and even some of the suckers. So like I said, when we go out in the field, we're gonna measure all these fish individually. Does anybody want to measure and weigh a fish? I'll try it. All right, cool. So we're gonna go with one of these guys for you. This right here is a northern hog sucker. Really cool tiger pattern on those guys. We measure from snout to tail tip. Push the nose up against here. We measured that here on the metric side. So this would be 195. And then you can set that right there on the scale. You're just hang him. Oh yeah. <laughs> 89 <laughs> grams. And 89 grams. All right, excellent. Another fan favorite, a mottled sculpin. They're really neat. They look like something out of the ocean, like a sculpin you would see in the ocean. This right here is a green sunfish. They're a tolerant species, so they can live in that degraded water. It's not a problem that we see green sunfish. We just want to keep that balance to have both sensitive and tolerant species available. Okay. So on the evening of day one, we invited Dr. Luke Jacobus. He's a professor of biology um, and a specialist in benthic macroinvertebrates, particularly mayflies. And he brought gear along to show us what the insect biology looks like around the river. So I'll give it another 10-ish minutes, and then I'll go and set sure. stuff up, and then it's just a matter of standing around and waiting for 45 minutes to an hour. This deal probably has dead bugs in it from last year. Indiana is the state with the largest historical diversity of mayflies west of the Appalachian Mountains. Right now I've got a short-term conservation grant from the Indianapolis Zoo to look at endangered and threatened mayfly species in Indiana, some that people haven't seen for 50 years or more. More than I'd like to admit how many of them fall into that category and I'm trying to find them again. Hoping this evening to find something interesting coming off the West Fork of the White River. White River is one of the better rivers in Indiana and uh, if the bugs cooperate, maybe we'll get some mayflies at the black light. So we definitely got a lot of midges. We got a lot of caddisflies. There's a crane fly. Oh my God, that's just like... <laughs> Here's a mayfly actually right there. Yep, mayfly. Got cenids, the small square gill mayflies. They live in, on the surface of sediment. And some of these will just live a few hours. You like yeah. yeah. Wow. Your ability of to pick those out amongst the tens of thousands of well, other insects is... I'm like a hungry trout. I've got the search image for it. <laughs> so that's the mayflies I pulled out of there. After a breakfast on day two, we packed up some of our gear and we headed across the river to Hidden Canal Nature Preserve, which is a property owned by Redtail Land Conservancy. This is something that we just acquired in the last couple of years, and so this is just at the beginning stages. So sometimes we're fortunate enough to protect a 40 or 80 acre beautiful tract of woods that may be in great shape, and then other times we're protecting land that's very strategic. If you're going to be in this business, it's for the future, so you kind of have to be able to think, you know, this may not be um, a pristine nature preserve in my lifetime, but we're doing this forever for future generations. So yeah, well with that, let's, let's go take a walk. So when people are here at Mounds camping, you know, at the 
the launch, the sandbar, this is what we're talking about. We're trying to protect the scenic view across from them. The White River is a big part of our strategic conservation plan. We know that protecting land along the White River, the Mississinawa River, the Whitewater River, and the Big Blue River, which are all in our East Central Indiana region, we know that's the best way to add connectivity, protect biodiversity, you know, improve water quality. That's where we're working really proactively with landowners to protect land. But then, you know, we'll talk to anybody who's interested in conservation and how can I improve the land for wildlife habitat, leave it in a better state that I found it. We want to, you know, offer for our you know, free resources. Instead of launching the raft right away, we're actually gonna do some Hoosier River Watch basic training. So we're gonna do some of the basic procedures. We do it really well in that gravel bar in the middle of the river. A little silly. Uh, grab one of each of these sheets. I'll pass mm -hmm. around to you guys. Got the blue sheet is what we call our flow sheet, so we're going to calculate flow and volumes of the river. Then we'll have habitat index, the chemistry sheet, and the macroinvertebrates. But you just use kind of common sense of what you think things mean. They work together, kind of talk about it, uh, figure out maybe what are the best answers to those questions, and then we'll calculate the score. We're doing the gravel bar from the end of the gravel bar to the end of the gravel bar. Okay. So everything. So we have down trees. I would say we have deep spots. No chest deep area. We'll measure width, we'll measure depth at three points on that width, and then we'll measure velocity by using something that floats, a timer, and our measuring tape. So we'll know how much distance it covered in a set amount of time that'll let us calculate our velocity. You can do it. I was going to reach for a second. I me too. Stop. 12.8 seconds. Um, 15.7. So that reagent is reacting with the water. That's going to tell us how much uh, dissolved oxygen is in that water. Yep. I'll let you guys kind of match it up and feel what you what you think might be right. I would definitely say. Yeah, I would say eight. Yeah. Eight. Say eight. Yeah. Eight is pretty typical. A lot of Indian streams most of the time. Last thing we're gonna do is my favorite part. We're gonna do a little bit of benthic macroinvertebrate sampling. So that's the aquatic larval stages of some of the insects we saw last night. And you move your feet back and forth like this, and you're actually trying to kick up that substrate because that's where those larval stages live. This here is actually a mayfly larva. Oh, oh wow. Yep. I'm not as good as Luke, so I can't tell you which species they are. So it may or may not be the same species as what we saw terrestrial last night. This is like a larvae. That's crazy. That's awesome. Right there? That one is a damselfly. Anybody see anything else that's not a skunk? I think crane flies have the big school. Oh yeah, that's probably a caddisfly. You can find all these species in this type of water, but you won't find these species in this type of water. And that's what allows us for biodiversity. We've got high quality water, we've got the high oh, diversity up here, so. Mm -hmm. right, so let's load this up. Um, if you guys don't mind loading those boxes up over there, we're gonna get the raft going. And we organized this river expedition as an opportunity to see the river, observe the river, measure the river. I also hope that you know, the students walk away with not only presence of mind that there's a river in their backyard, but that it may inspire them to see Midwestern rivers as part of their career path. The perspectives they provide are kind of a proxy for their generation and how students are looking at natural resources in today's age. These students approach the experience with so much energy and optimism. It's really encouraging for the future of conservation, uh, the future of the Nature Conservancy, the future of other partner organizations is having that type of talent coming up through great universities like Ball State. Would you guys recommend this to your peers? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah for time. sure. Seriously, this has been awesome.
The future of the Nature Conservancy's work in the White River, it's going to focus on water quality. It's going to focus on working with organizations that want to get people on the river. All of our river systems are very interconnected in Indiana, so that's why the Nature Conservancy finds it so important here. Thank you. Thank you very much. We hope that this expedition is a way to tell that story and encourage others to do the same.